Greetings, everyone, and so great to kick off the new year with all of you. It's going to be a very interesting 2024, as you can imagine, and it's going to require plenty of courage and community and change making to get through it, I believe. So I'm Rhonda Bannard, and I am founder and executive director of Earth Gives. And one of our key operating principles is driving change with and through community. And that change is particularly on climate change and the environment, but uh, literally building community, which is so critically needed. So before I turn it all over to Michelle, I wanted to invite everyone to introduce yourselves, where you're tuning in from. And I'm gonna invite you to uh, ask the rest of us for one thing. And I know we're mostly strangers, but that's okay. It takes a little bit of courage to ask strangers for one thing and let your imagination run wild. And so let's go ahead and practice that. Holly, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, my name is Holly Sarkissian, and I'm tuning in from Phoenix. As you may have heard Rhonda mention earlier, uh, before that I was in Austin and then uh, more than a decade in New York City. So I currently am a fundraiser for a wide variety of nonprofits focused on climate and international development initiatives. So I work on all, I, I'm a jack of all trades fundraiser. So I'm working on individual giving, grant writing, corporate sponsorships with uh, small community organizations all the way up to international NGOs. So I'm excited to learn more about Florida Green Schools today and connect with all of you. Uh, and what's your, what's your ask? <laughs> my ask? Well, I did recently launch a product for small and startup nonprofits because that's the roots where I come from. And so I'm offering like a more affordable package for that group. Um, and so if you know anyone who like that might be a fit for, that would be amazing. That's great. And hi, Teresa, we'll get to you in just a minute. So glad you're here. Um, Sandy, why don't you introduce yourself? Let us know where you're coming in from and what, uh, might you ask of us? Um, sure. Thank you. First of all, thank you, Rhonda, for putting this together, um, this is the first time I'm meeting everyone. I don't know if this is um, a regular occurrence and y'all have been doing this, but um, this is my first For time. For a year. <laughs> okay, good. Um, this is my first time here. And Rhonda and I met at South by Southwest um, in March of 2023, this last one. And so that's how we got acquainted. But yeah, I'm in, I live in Austin. Um, I've been... Uh, for 20, I've been in business for myself for 22, little over 22 years. And I've been a lot of that time teaching businesses, all nothing corporate, nothing publicly traded. It's all small businesses, um, how to grow value and run a better business and, um, you know, teaching and training, um, businesses all these years. And I, at the beginning of the pandemic pivoted towards sustainability. And so now I'm helping businesses to sometimes for the first time implement sustainability initiatives in their companies. Um, and sometimes they've already started and I'm helping them take it further. I've got some clients that all I'm doing is um, helping them with carbon footprinting. So it just kind of depends on where they are in the game, but they're all small businesses. They're all privately held. Um, because that's the market of, that's the size of business market that I really know. Um, and that's where my expertise is. So I have an online training program for small businesses that focuses on, um, really small that are getting started. I've found a lot of young entrepreneurs that predominantly women, um, but that they want to start their business and they want to start it with sustainability in mind. So that's what my program teaches is both how to run a business and, and how to do it with sustainability. So my ask is that um, I actually am doing a, uh, a joint webinar um, in just under two weeks. And I would love it if y'all would um, share that. I mean, I can put it in the chat. 
Please do. I, yeah. Yeah, okay. that'd be great. Share your webinar. Okay. We're definitely building our asking muscle. Thank you. Carol, why don't you introduce yourselves where you're coming in from and your ask? Okay, I'm coming in from Sierra Vista, Arizona. Uh, I was originally, I was in, up in the valley. <clears throat> and right here, we're conducting an experiment along with a second site next to the Boyce Thompson Arboretum in Arizona uh, for uh, a new kind of formation of groups to divide up work to restore the planet. Uh, and that's uh, groups in rainwater harvesting, food forestry, and also environmental plantings and uh, soil reclamation. Um, and uh, so right now, we're getting volunteers together to put it together. Right now in Sierra Vista, we're working with the city of Sierra Vista for an urban site. And the one next to the Boyce Thompson Arboretum is out in the wild country, we'll call it. Uh, and uh, so when we're done with that, uh, I'm an instructional designer also, working with training. And we're going to develop that into a training, a teacher and student training package that will go worldwide for the upper primary grades to be able to do this, to divide into three groups and do this right outside their schools around the world. And we're in the process right now of working with an organization in Spain to uh, 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 take our, uh, well, we'll start with our website, but we're going to do some other translations uh, into a wide variety of foreign languages so that this can get out into the world very quickly. So working now with that. My ask, uh, we do need another board member. I would love to have someone who's interested in volunteering as a board member. Uh, right now we're meeting monthly, but uh, after that it will probably meet a little bit less often, but we're uh, organizing and doing some good things now. Thanks. Any special skill set that you need, Carol? No, just uh, be willing. Warm to, body. <laughs> well, if, if you have some uh, business experience, that would be very helpful. Uh, I'll just okay. put it that way. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Elizabeth, how's it going? Are you staying warm? Hi. I am. <laughs> Milwaukee, I'm coming in from Milwaukee, and we just had a crazy, like, negative, like, 10 degree week, but it's actually really warm now. It's like 45 degrees. Okay. Um, sorry, I joined a little bit late. We had the team launch that went a little long because we just got a new executive director who is actually a woman. So we're super excited about that, which is <laughs> awesome. awesome. Um, but yeah, so I work at Bubbler Bikes, which is Greater Milwaukee's nonprofit bike share. So like uh, capital city bike um, in D.C. and then also like city bike in New York, that kind of thing. Except we're not owned by Uber or Lyft. We're just 10 people. Um, but <laughs> someone at my door. That's funny. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I did join a little late. So I guess we're just asking like how we can support each other, that kind of thing. Well, you introduce yourself. So the at what whatever you'd like to ask for. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, starting today, uh, Bubbler Bikes is doing an online silent auction with a local woman-owned jewelry store in Milwaukee, and everything was donated by them, and all the profits go to Bubbler. So I'm gonna send the link in the chat. Um, it goes from now through February 11th, and then we can also ship stuff if anyone wants to buy from wherever you are here. It'll just still have to pay for shipping after the auction. But that's really the only thing that you can do from where you are to support Bubbler, just because we are very hyper local in Milwaukee. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm super stoked to meet all of you and connect with these events. I, I already have the page from uh, the Green and Lane Sustainable Profit tomorrow. I'm about to register for that for. I forget who said that, but yeah, 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 Sandy. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to register like right now. So I'm going to do oh, that. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks All for having right. me again. Yeah, Erin. Hi, new to the group. Um, Welcome. I'm, yeah, I'm Erin Siner. I'm in the Bay Area and I am with the Tides Foundation. I don't know if anybody is familiar with Tides, but- Very. Uh, Woohoo! Yeah, okay. So we are a nonprofit so we have this nonprofit side to our work and we have this philanthropic side to our work. So we we um, sponsor a bunch of, you know, wonderful, <clears throat> uh, soon to be often nonprofits, et cetera, many of which are in climate and conservation. And then I'm on the foundation side and I have a portfolio of corporations where I um, advise on their philanthropic giving, et cetera. So I... In, you know, my ask at Tides, we're all about centering equity and justice. So I'm really thinking about that advancing social justice piece, um, really thinking about leaning hard into um, shifting power to communities that haven't been at the table, et cetera, many of which are communities of color, women included in all of that, et cetera. So um, 
even in your hyper localized areas, I love to hear of great <clears throat> climate conservation groups that have that value <clears throat> piece of centering equity in it um, and with leadership by by that that notion of problems and solutions are found in the same place too. So um, send them what my way. Um, lots of the companies have geographic areas here in the United States and are looking to um, fund, yeah, some of some of those groups. So that's my ask. Yeah. And find out more about tides. I'll I'll put us in the <laughs> I'll put us in the chat. That would be fantastic. You're the fiscal sponsor for a couple nonprofits. Oh, that yay. Yeah. And I don't know all gifting. those and they're just amazing. And we won't Well yeah. isn't Climate Voice one in of them? Climate Voice is. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, they are. No and doubt. And I'm gonna see Bill and Deb. They're gonna be here for the Green Biz conference. I think Deb is the one who who got me connected. Okay. Right? Yes. And I it's this bridging of doers and donors. I mean, if we we definitely I, I love need that. to know each other. Yeah. I love that. Okay, great. Um, Teresa. Is she there? Scientist. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. You are. <laughs> moving no, about your been, house, eh? Yeah, I've been in meetings for since for the last four hours. This is my first chance to like make lunch and get something to eat. Okay. And my dog's upset. Sorry about that. Um, so I am a associate professor at University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix, and with Phoenix Children's Hospital. And I'm the director of the Translational Neurotrauma and Neurochemistry Lab. And so we do a lot of translational work um, based on diffuse accidental injury, which is the primary pathology for uh, concussion and looking at adolescent uh, media or adolescent pubescent, uh, uh, or, okay, pubescent age group to look at the mechanisms that are contributing to persisting post-concussive symptoms and looking at uh, the impact of early rehabilitation, looking at and identifying new mechanisms and uh, our endocrine disruption that can all help us better treat the patient population because they're at such a critical time point um, during that where they're in puberty. And one of the, you know, a couple of the most prominent symptoms are anxiety and stress related, um, increased suicide. Uh, there's also hypersensitivity and balance issues. And then even later um, is some cognitive decline. And so those types of things, if we can address them early and prevent them, then we can have better guidance from our physicians and we can guide our physicians on how to better care and, and how to translationally um, evaluate that in the patient population and whether these strategies that are working in our animal models are actually working in uh, the clinic as well. And so uh, I had no idea to come for and ask. I think yeah, I just got off a call with, with some of my students and, and, and a lot of it is people aren't aware of traumatic brain injury, post-concussive symptoms, unless it's like CTE or something in football. But this is something that happens on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's a car accident, a trip and a fall, um, you know, the, the one off where these can have long-term consequences, if not identified and related to the traumatic brain injury. And so not only do we need to come up with new strategies for treatment, we also have to keep parents and, and physicians educated on what they should be looking for in their patient populations and what kind of populations may be more vulnerable to uh, symptoms that may, you know, cause a, a long-term deficit in their quality of life. Um, and that's what their social relationships, education, integration, and re basic relationships. And so my ask is an increase of awareness. And then we're always looking for funding um, to fund experiments. We, our lab's done some of the introductory work to looking at both males and females after traumatic brain injury, where we're seeing numerous um, differences. And so we're always limited by the amount of funding and the timing it takes to get funding um, to really delve into these to the extent that we would like to. And so there's always that opportunity to support the research. Um, but those, those are the two. <laughs> Thanks, Teresa. I know it's like you have to listen closely to understand this big 
brain that she's got and how she works on brain health. But I had the great opportunity to coach Teresa for um, pitches <laughs> that she made to win money. And um, I've just learned so much. And one of the things that I loved about her is that she was really advocating for women to be treated more fairly within the you know, health and, and medical um, frame, because we always do testing and funding on men and not for women, so to speak. So thanks for being here, Teresa. Alexis, thanks for inviting Alexis. me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alexis Snelling. I'm CEO of Skillville. I'm also Google Women Tech Maker Ambassador here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I am familiar with Tides. Uh, it's a great community. I am in the Fillmore District, if you know San Francisco. And uh, we founded this startup to create a new social network. Um, we're hearing a lot in the news. You've probably heard congressional meetings with all of the CEOs of many of the social networks, and they are failing in many ways. And so we have a social network that connects people um, based on their skills, and based on how we could connect to collaborate to solve a problem. So basically a social network with a purpose. It's a little different than a social network just to, uh, based on likes and friends and follows and who you know, we care more and use AI for good in the way that we can connect people with the resources at the right moment in time to maximize their success and impact and make a bigger difference by connecting people with the resources they need, whether that's other people in a network, uh, resources financially, resources knowledge, or just ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support so that you're never alone on the journey. Um, so it's a new social network, a new vision for what we see as a more equitable way to connect and a way that we can all level up and uh, make the pie bigger. So my ask right now, um, during the pandemic, we were a little bit in stealth mode. We partnered with uh, innovation programs and universities to make sure that our product was successful and achieving all the metrics and goals that we set out to achieve. Um, so we were able to help our communities and our programs actually get a million dollar ARPA grant for a four week digital transformation program and run the whole thing on on our platform. So now that we know it works, it makes a difference. Um, we can connect communities in this way. We want to connect with all of you as leaders and figure out how we could get our tools in your hands and we can really um, set this on fire now that we're out of stealth mode <laughs> in 2024 and we're ready to to really launch it um, publicly and so any thoughts ideas um, you can check us out at skillville.com and I would be happy to um, help any of you with tools so that your missions and the projects you're working on can get seen and attract sponsors as well as other potential partners so we can make a bigger impact together. Fantastic. Congratulations. Wow, that's big. Millie, before we hand it over to Michelle, you're on mute. You're on mute, my friend. Thank you. I always laugh when other people do it, and then I do it myself. Um, I was volunteering in a garden this morning, so I'm still dressed for the garden. Sorry about that. And I am I am not at all in the same position, I don't think, as the rest of you who have spoken. Um, I'm a fairly recent retiree after a 30-plus career as a chief engineer, um, engineer and then ending as a chief engineer at Raytheon. I call myself a recovering engineer. <laughs> And uh, I, my husband and I, I come from a, con a conservation-minded family. Sorry, my dog seems to want to want to go in and out. Um, and I am dedicating the rest of my life to conservation of of many forms. Um, right now, I would call myself volunteer extraordinaire because I'm trying to figure out the best way to plug into things. I met Rhonda at Environmental Day at the Capitol last week, a week ago today. And in that capacity, I was representing 
a local Tucson organization called Sustainable Tucson, specifically the Water Committee and a um, HOA task force where we're going to try to influence HOAs to um, learn about and utilize better strategies for water use in arid conditions. Uh, but I also have a huge passion for regenerative agriculture and everything that goes with soil health, including composting. So Rhonda and I talked about composting quite a bit. And um, I, I, uh, my husband and I have coined a acronym and we don't know quite yet to do with it, what to do with it yet. It's called HERONS, which is Healing Through Electrification regener Regeneration organics and natural solutions. So we're trying to decide if that's a foundation or a nonprofit or what, whatever. And meantime, we're just plugging into the community in various ways. I don't have a personal request right now. Um, the only thing I can think of is on behalf of the Water Committee for Sustainable Tucson, there's a Love My Basin campaign if you have a passive water basin on your property and you are on Facebook or I think also Instagram, um, we ask people to post pictures of their passive water basins with a hashtag love my basin. So um, pretty small Thanks, compared Millie. to everyone else. Thanks. Carol, I think you might've found your next board member. <laughs> <laughs> Millie, be careful what you uh, offer. Uh, yeah, so I just joined two other boards and I was already on one. So I'm fairly, <laughs> fairly occupied. Okay, well, you two can talk. Well, sometimes uh, community gets built when um, when you ask. And when I listened to the America America Climate Corps recently, um, uh, a, a Zoom session, through the White House, there were a few folks that shared some interesting ideas. And one of them uh, caught my attention and her name is Michelle Drucker. And so I followed up, um, found her on LinkedIn and here we are today, she said yes. But before I pass it over to Michelle, I'm gonna say that my ask for the day is for all of you to follow Earth Gives on all the basic social media platforms. We're building a community of Earth Givers and for us, that means where you give your your dollars, your time, your vote, your voice, um, your even consumer habits. This is about sort of building an identity of earth givers across the country and beyond so that we can really drive forward on the solutions that we that we need. Um, now I'd like to throw it over to, did she disappear? <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, um, she is a Floridian, a lawyer, uh, a government leader, a PTA member, an awesome mom, and a change maker. So please welcome Michelle. Thank you so much, Rhonda. And it's great to meet all of you from all across the country. I'm really um, very touched that you uh, appreciated what you, you felt I had to communicate to other people and that there might be some kernels of um, inspiration for all of you and some ideas you can bring forward. I'm gonna put in the ask right here, uh, essentially my LinkedIn, so you can find me on LinkedIn. And then if you think that these ideas are worthy, um, if you could follow up with uh, the American Climate Corps folks, cause they wanna hear from other you know, stakeholders, ideas. And I could, I did get the sense, I appreciate that Rhonda sought me out, but I could see the, the hosts, you know, they kind of perked up when I described what we're doing in floor here in Florida and the recommendations I had, because we did hear a lot of social justice is so important and what's Biden doing and what about this and that. And, and my um, kind of, I mean, I, I hear those themes and they're absolutely valid and I, and I support it and I see it here in Miami as well. Um, but I kind of do the do what you can with what you have where you are. And that's kind of the starting point that I try to to come from, because I feel there is so much opportunity just in the school setting at the most and not asking teachers to do it because teachers are tasked with way too much. This is plain old school operations, getting people in the cafeteria setting, 
you know, talking to the bus drivers, asking them to turn off their engines, helping with food waste reduction, setting up share cards, um, maybe offering composting, showing kids how to recycle, things like that. Just there is sort of this um, assumption that if you educate people, they will change their habits. And the data shows that education alone is not an indicator that people will change habits. You have to get them engaged in the habits to internalize it as a new habit. So that's essentially um, the approach that we have tried to take here in Miami. And I will share my screen now. And I, again, I put in the ask my, um, like my LinkedIn, and then you can send written comments to acc at americorps.gov. So I told Rhonda- and Michelle, if, if you might just give a framework of what your day job is, and then oh. kind of how you came to this, um, you know, what you did, did on your day job that was outside of your job and then how this kind of transpired before you share what it is. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I am a lifelong Floridian, grew up in Martin County, about a hundred miles north of Miami on the Indian River Lagoon. It's uh, a waterway that goes from the center of the state out to the ocean, but it's a main artery from Lake Okeechobee which is where all the water from South Florida comes down and it percolates across the a million and a half acres of the Everglades. It's where we get our fresh water. So I uh, really had this quite magical childhood in this really under, under uh, populated part of Florida. So I definitely had this attachment to nature at a really young age. Um, from there, I went to college out of state. I went into the Peace Corps and then I came back to Miami for law school. And then I became an attorney with the Department of Homeland Security. I was a law clerk for a federal judge. And then I was like, ah, I did prior practice for a little bit, hated it. So I said, no, I'd rather be an attorney in the federal government. And I started a green team in my agency. Was, my office is right on the Miami River. And I would see manatees. There are manatees like just last week that I saw in the Miami River. It's a working river. It's filthy. It's got tugboats and pleasure and pleasure craft and trash. And these manatees have been breeding up that waterway for whatever, a thousand years. So it's the kind of animals I saw growing up. And I thought, well, who's responsible for this? And it occurred to me, why not me? You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm an attorney. I work for a big agency. There's got to be something I can do. And that's how I stumbled across the Department of Homeland Security's Climate Action Plan and Strategic Sustainability Performance Plan. It was my aha moment. I tried to learn as much as I could because it's very confusing to know what are the big ticket items. We can't do everything. You know, let's try to do something. Um, I remember hearing stories about how on the radio, oh, you know, use loose tea instead of tea bags. It, it's more environmentally friendly. And I remember thinking tea bags are not causing, you know, the, the ice sheets to collapse. Like, come on. So to me, that was my big learning moment. And I created a green team based on the climate action plan. And I educated my colleagues about our strategies as our agency and how to incorporate um, better environmental practices and day-to-day -day operations. And we won lots of awards until Trump got elected. And then I was told I can't do the green team anymore. And I thought, well, that's not gonna work for me. <laughs> so I actually, I pivoted to the school setting and actually my kids are in the photo behind me um, at a school called Mast Academy. It's a Marine Stewardship themed school and a teacher said, hey, we've kind of lost our way. We have new construction. Will you help create kind of a, a green team at our school? And I said, sure, I'm sure there's a climate action plan for Miami-Dade schools. I mean, it's an $8 billion a year institution and they spend like, I mean, I didn't know this at the time, but I learned all this. It's part of my elevator pitch. Um, they spend 80 million a year on, on energy costs. I'm sure They've got a manual, they've got a green team, they've got nothing, there was nothing. So I thought, well, how, what can I do on the operational side, right, that engages people, hands-on stuff, and I discovered something called Florida Green Schools, and I call it kind of like mini lead, um, and the way we really, we just kept, um, we got that uh, recognition, and it was sort of 
we got the grass tops buy-in from the principal because if a principal can get recognition, they're going to like it. And then we got the kids buy-in because they need their service hours and they, and they like, you know, they like gardens. And like the other image behind me is a coastal restoration project in Virginia Key um, off Biscayne Bay. And it was the only part of that little key that didn't erode during Hurricane Maria because it's native plants. And so the kids really saw, you know, that impact. Um, and we just kept scaling it and scaling it until we created a, a uh, county group and now a Florida um, PTA, a sustainability group. And we got our school board to commit to 100% clean energy. So it really started hyper local and we just keep you know, building the the kind of core of the purpose. But I don't know, I guess that was probably, that's kind of like what my PowerPoint's gonna be, but I'll I'll show the visuals now if that's okay. Yeah, okay. Um, where is it? Um, nope, I don't think that's it. Oops, sorry, this is definitely not it. Sorry, let me go back. Oh, I think I accidentally got it. Oh, because I'm in my son's. There it is. There it is. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I can't seem to share anymore. Oh, there. Okay. I'm so sorry. There it is. It's okay. We just saw you share something. So there okay. you go. So I want to make this. How do I make the whole screen? I don't know. I'm not always able to do that, but fine. Okay. So what is Florida Green Schools? And the reason why I kind of bring this up is the process of, of um, making this happen is really, it's the power of the increment, right? It's, it's bit by bit. And what I communicate initially is if people show up to assist, like these are kind of the reasons that are getting people to act. Like action is, is an antidote to the anxiety and the climate anxiety. And there's a huge amount of climate anxiety among young people. Um, so we, you know, these are the, these are the issues that I saw that got me motivated. So this is where I grew up on the Indian River Lagoon to the left. Um, that's Sewell's Point. Beautiful, beautiful place to grow up. Very under, you know, populated. So there weren't a lot of kids around. So I spent a lot of time on that water with my Labrador retriever who loved to be in the water. And to the right is an image of a boy whose mom is a, blood risk consultant scientist, and that's the amount of sea level rise that he should anticipate in his lifetime, about five feet. Um, can you hear this? Can you hear that? Can you hear the, can you hear the, can you hear me? Yeah, can, but could you hear the um, video playing? A little bit, like a heartbeat. I know by the time she takes her first Oh, there breath. you go. Yeah. Nine billion more tons of carbon pollution will be in the air when she takes her first steps. Wildfires will have burned millions more acres she could have explored. The day she gets her first pet, there are thousands of newly extinct species she'll never meet. The night she forgets to call, the night of her first heartbreak, her future home floods for the first of many times. By the time a child born today goes to college, it may be too late to leave the world we promised. Our window to act on climate change is like watching them grow up. We blink and we miss it. So I like to show that because being a mom is my other motivator. Um, and you know, I try to kind of communicate, let me see, I oh, know that's it. I try to communicate the urgency. Like we cannot just keep waiting and wait, like we have to act, right? We know 2030 is, um, was kind of the, the drop dead date that the, uh, IPCC gave us to reduce, uh, emissions in half to try to stabilize the climate. So that's the emotional piece. That's my why. And then I give kind of more, um, concrete kind of reasons, like why we need to make these shifts. So why green schools, you get better learning outcomes. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has an article that if you reduce idling, it, re it improves English scores by 7%. That's meaningful. 
healthier school environments. When you have gardens, kids will try vegetables, they'll try new things. Um, it's very therapeutic to have these school gardens. Green energy career pathways, just in Florida alone, it's an $18 billion a year energy uh, industry and kids could have you know, good careers at the end of it, like our engineer, who uh, retired engineer. More resilient schools, a lot of schools are hurricane shelters in Florida or um, might serve as some other um, you know, shelter during, during climate disasters. So at this school in Titusville, they were able to use solar and battery backup to keep a classroom running. Money savings, that's the other big thing. Uh, in Arkansas, they put 1,400 panels on schools and turned a $250,000 deficit into a $1.8 million surplus. Teachers got raises. And school operations, most people do not know. School operations are the six, second biggest expense after teacher salaries. So it's a big deal. And in Florida, what I was trying to push for rooftop solar is that uh, our energy provider, FPNL, which is rated as like 49 out of 50 and getting anything and everything it ever wants from our public service commission, um, their rates were going up 21%. And that was even before Russia invaded Ukraine. So a lot of these energy companies, these um, they're really fossil fuel companies. 70% of Florida's energy is comes from natural gas. And you know, don't let people tell you, oh, natural gas, it's cleaner. Well, no, not if you get a methane leak. It's Methane is much more powerful than carbon dioxide. So they are not really part of the solution yet, and rooftop solar would be. Busing. So we're, we just actually, this is pretty exciting. We now have 100 EV buses coming to Miami-Dade schools. The first 50 were through the Volkswagen Settlement Fund, um, where we had kids. And then the second 50 we have just received through the clean bus program through the EPA. You know, we throw out a ton of plastic. And this is the one thing I really think with the American Climate Corps, this idea that everybody wants to give curriculum and have teachers teach something new and teachers do more and teachers do this and teach, no. Where they need help, in my opinion, in the school setting and where you can have yet another learning opportunity in that cafeteria. They are they are chronically understaffed, they're part-time workers, they are, you know, uh, blue collar workers. Most of them are African American in our school setting or Hispanic. So in my opinion, there you get your climate justice piece, right? You get to communicate to those cafeteria workers why this is so important for their health, right? And we're learning now that um Plastic is an even bigger hazard than we than we knew uh, before that a water bottle has like 250,000 part micro particles that we don't even know what the long term health impacts are going to be because we've never had this much plastic, um, you know, in our day to day lives. Schools throw away five million dollars uh, a day in uneaten food. So and this is an image from our school of food that was just going to get thrown out. And then I try to tell kids, I'm like, okay, not only will you save your school money, you'll have better learning outcomes. It'll be better for your health. It'll be better for the health of drivers, better for the health of teachers, like all around. Sustainability is very mainstream. These are careers that you can pursue long, you know, long term. Disney's been carbon neutral since 2012. Uh, there's something called the Green Sports Alliance. Uh, Walmart had Project Gigaton. A gigaton is the equivalent of taking all cars off U.S. roads for a year. And then drawdown. So just like I explained at the beginning that I was looking for the big ticket items that could make the biggest difference, um, I got very excited to learn like, okay, these are the top 10. Reduce food waste. We can reduce food waste. Like everyone can be part of that solution. You don't have to buy solar panels or a Tesla or you know, ex expensive stuff. So that's where I think, again, the school setting and particularly with this American Climate Corps, um, connecting federal dollars with this education, they might start to make the connection that now the USDA is pushing free lunches. Like they keep pushing free food, free lunches, all kids get it free, free, free. I'm like, well, the reality is my kid doesn't need a free lunch. Um, and Food's getting thrown away. So you are not, 40% of lunches are getting thrown away. So we're 
like compounding the problem and people need to really look at it. And of course, you know, we know the dairy industry and the meat industry is a very powerful lobbying group and milk has to be served to the kids, even though they don't drink it. So there's just huge opportunity in, in my opinion on, in this area. Um, and then I try to share, look, there's billions of dollars available right now for um, school improvements. So that's the EV buses. Now this young lady right here, Holly Thorpe, she was a student, uh, well, she still is a student at Mass. I still work with her. And part of this Florida Green Schools application uh, assesses air quality. And we could not get our bus drivers to turn off their engines. So I said, you know what? I need someone to measure the bus well, the um, vehicle emissions in the buses and let's report on it. Well, she discovered in seventh grade that the emissions from the bus had um, 10, 10 times the recommended air quality from the EPA. So it was like 5,000 parts per million. And that was, so normally it should be 500, maybe up to a thousand. So it was 10 times higher than what the EPA recommends. And it was worse inside the bus. So we brought that information to the school board. We said, look, we have a problem. And this is not unique. I mean, it, all across Miami, everyone idles needlessly. But um, we brought it to the school board. We said, we have a problem, but we also have a solution. So it was hard. Like, it was crazy hard. These The transportation department said, we don't care if they're free. We don't want them. So we had to keep pushing until they actually became free. So um so I won't go too much into the, the granular part of this Florida Green Schools application, but it's good to be aware. You can always go to their website. It's on the Florida Department of Environmental Protection website. It's a one woman show that runs this program. Um, I call it baby lead, but it does create a broader awareness across the school setting on these, again, these kind of big ticket items. So, and communication and education, really, really vital. When I was working with my colleagues at DHS um, in the Climate Action Plan, I talked to somebody at Berkeley Laboratories and he said, look, it is so critical that you give people feedback. You've got to communicate your goals, you start executing on your goals, and then you have to tell people how they're doing. He said, the worst thing you can do is start something and drop it and then just don't explain. He said, that's really terrible messaging. So these are the categories. So here we're doing uh, LED retrofits in the school, water conservation, waste, uh, waste recycling, composting. Everyone's dialed into recycling. Right? Everybody thinks recycling is the answer. Well, that's all marketing because the plastic industry wants to put the burden on the consumers to deal with their hazardous product. And that was that whole crying Indian um, ad from like, the late seventies that I remember as a kid. And that was a, a targeted campaign by the plastics industry because they knew that people were saying after Earth Day, hey, what, what, what's going on with all this plastic? Let me tell you, it's been effective because they intend on increasing plastic uh, production fivefold or by 2030. So it's not going away and we have to really push back against it. Um, air quality, transportation to the spike to school. These are all pictures of like actual pictures from the school. And then not that it would necessarily impact you guys directly, but here are two of our students, our principal, a teacher. Um, schools that get this Florida designation can go on to become a US Department of Education Green Ribbon School, which has three pillars, which is the operational piece, the curriculum piece, and then community engagement. And that again is a big feather in any principal superintendent's cap because you can only get uh, five of these are awarded per state per year. And it can be um, you know, a public school, private school, university. Um, so anyway, so these are the strategies. You create a green team, create this garden. So here is the scorecard for my agency, right? That Again, the big ticket items um, and evaluating your environmental performance. So you can see that's what their focus is, water, renewables, energy intensity. Um, the other strategy we used is once we won these awards, once you kind of walk the talk, because that's the other thing, it's like what Leo DiCaprio gets criticized for is like, oh, or Al Gore, 
oh, he talks about climate reality, but he flies around on a private jet. Like people just talking about why there's a problem just have less credibility um, unless they're working to solve it. So once we had some designated Florida green schools, then we asked, then as a PTA, we said, okay, we want to communicate the importance of this. So um, I drafted a resolution if anybody wants one for their own school district or their own PTA in their state. And we passed it at the local level. And then we asked Florida to pass it. And we brought that resolution to our school board and said, hey, this is important for us. Please, um, you know, make this a priority. And what I have definitely found is, again, you're always, it's all about relationships. It's all about leveraging egos. I brought it to one school board member who sat in on something like this when she was running and, oh, this is so great. It's so great. And, you know, patting everybody on the head, like you're doing such good work. And then I said, well, will you adopt a resolution and make it a priority? Oh, I'm not so sure. I said, okay. So then I went to somebody else. And she said, oh, absolutely, I want to do it. And I said, okay, well, let me go back to the other board member and just explain that there's interest from someone else. And maybe, you know, it, would it be okay if she did it? And she's like, oh, no, 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 I want to do it. I want to do it. So that's how we got something like this passed in Miami-Dade schools. Um, okay, so here's the application. They ask about utility information. You know, again, it, it is hyper-local. You've got to get to know your custodian, your zone mechanic. You have to have boots on the ground. Again, this is where an American Climate Corps member, just like Teach for America, but they're working on the operational side, could come in and make this difference and create this awareness. Um, here, it's not very, this application itself, not too intense. You only have to create this threshold, 50% of some of the things they asked for, but this is a way we communicated our program. Here are our kids talking to the school board. Kids love to do that. Oh my God, do they love to tell the school board members why the plastic is bad and why are the classrooms freezing and why are the buses idling? I mean, it truly is the emperor has no clothes. It is, my brother likes to call it a hyper fact. Everybody knows this is off the hook. So um, they will go and happily talk about the problem and that they want you know, the school board to be part of the solution. So um, that's just more of the application switch you in. Oh, so here it is, our school board member passing the resolution. This is image down here. She's wonderful. I hope she runs for higher office. She's young. She grew up in Columbia. And I will tell you, being in Miami, any of the South Americans that have the rainforest in within their country, so Venezuela, Colombia, um, Peru, they are so locked into um, environmental stewardship. Like it's really part of their identity. So it's been awesome. Although in other groups, not so much, but that those parent groups have been very um, informed. So that was great. So from that resolution, we, uh, she said, I want a task force. And I was vice chair of the task force for the clean energy uh, report. And so for nine months, we had 30 different stakeholders from the community, from land use attorneys, architects, solar installers, our chief resiliency officer for the county, the chief heat officer, the world's first actually, world's first chief uh, heat officer, um, and every department head within the school district. We all came together and just like the Florida Green Schools, we broke it out into air quality, transportation, waste reduction, holistic education, things like that. And the number one recommendation was hiring a sustainability officer that would help execute on this plan. And they did that. And she, in her first two years, got $19 million this year for 50 electric school buses. Um, she's applied for to the EPA for recycling grants and air quality grants and uh, energy conservation grants. And we're hoping that she gets more staff. They were kind of tentative to even commit to her position, which was kind of shocking, but now she's really showing that, you know, her, her value. So we're hoping that she'll get more staff. So essentially I have served as really super grassroots, but then we bring those families together. And again, we worked with the NAACP with their climate justice 
group and um, tried to come together. We had the kids. It was really cute. They did a little video. I speak for the trees in the class of 2030. So at the time they were third graders and they basically said, I want clean energy by the time I graduate, because this is what my amazing science teachers are telling me needs to be happening. You know, we need to move on this. So I think, oh, and here are some of the highlights from the task force report that um, I tried to make like a, well, it's two pages, but a one pager that I could give to school board members so they could get more buy-in. Um, hey, Michelle, I'd love to open it up so people can ask questions of you before we run out of time. Oh, sure, sure. If and that's, that's okay. Yep, and, that's it. I'm sorry. Yeah, and one of, the thing, one of the things that I was thinking um, is, uh, and Millie, I'll come to you in just a second, but also if Teresa's still on the neoplastics, um, you know, the, I, I've understood that they did break the blood brain barrier and that there's going to be impacts on our, on our brains. But, um, see, here's just a, an example of a passionate change maker who, you know, didn't necessarily hold the position, but stepped up. I know, isn't she amazing? And, um, and I think there were lessons of there and I know not everyone works in this space, but we, we come at it, you know, from a variety of ways and the change that she was able to create and how she, you know, brought, uh, folks together. So if you've got questions, Millie, we'll start with you and then anybody else just take yourself off mute and ask, uh, Michelle, a question. Yeah, thank you. I'll try to keep this short. So I am just learning about the American Climate Corps from you. Sadly, I feel like I should know more about it. And it looks like it's for um, youth primarily. And um, what one of my many positions, one of my board positions is on a HUD subsidized low income elderly housing facility. And I'm pushing really hard. I created a sustainability committee and I'm pushing hard for rooftop solar. And we're running into a lot of, uh, just just a lot of paperwork through HUD and um, uh, obligations that, that we don't necessarily have staff to meet. And I'm, I'm just thinking that um, it sounds like you were able to really leverage American Climate Corps a lot to help your efforts, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure that's a good fit for what I need. No, 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 I have not. Nope. No American Climate Corps. I am oh, pitching okay. American Climate Corps that they ought to create this model in the school setting. And, uh, and I, so and so it's sort of like Teach for America, but instead of um, teaching classes, the, the American Climate Corps, it's the same model as uh, the way they do Teach for America. And it's not just young people, just like I was in the Peace Corps. Peace Corps takes young people and old people. So um, okay. I'm hoping the American Climate Corps kind of grabs onto this. And my recommendation is going to be work in the cafeteria setting, work with the drivers, and then offer to be a substitute teacher teaching environmental lessons because teachers love that. They would so be ecstatic if they can just sit back and grade papers and get a break once in a while. But putting on teachers demanding that they teach climate curriculum, there's enough content out there. The, the problem is not the content. The problem right. is the people, they're missing bodies. And we're short 4,000 teachers in Florida. We don't pay them well. And we're on a witch hunt banning the dictionary. Like it's crazy. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Anybody else? And Millie, by the way, there might be at least one more listening session where you can tune in virtually and hear about the American Climate Corps and what it might do and give feedback to what it should do. Thoughts? Okay, Sandy, you. go ahead. Sure. So just so I'm clear, the Florida Green Schools, obviously is Florida. <laughs> um, is there something like that in other states? I, I think there must be because in order to become a U.S. Department of Education Green Ribbon School, the state has to elevate your school for consideration. So there has to be some, I mean, you could just go straight to the U.S. Department of Education Green Schools mm -hmm. uh, application and then figure out how, how do they assess the uh, operational side. Um, so... I'm, I'm sure every state has something like, well, no, I can't say that. No, I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't. Say that, <laughs> yeah. 
but it, it's not a bad, you could take that template if you wanted to, you guys are in Arizona, right? I'm not, I'm in Texas. Texas. By the way, I did go to Arizona state university for oh. a five day symposium called sustainability for middle managers. Cause I wanted that. I wanted to be around like-minded people and it was so much fun. Oh, it was just, I loved it. So, um, but anyway, I, you could just adopt it and just take the floor off, you know, and, and just use the same kind of strategy to, to hit those main areas. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Amazing work. And thank you so much for sharing it all. Anybody else? Any thoughts? Go ahead, Alexis. Yeah. Amazing. Super cool. I was a econ nerd growing up and in college. So all the impact work that you're doing, the grassroots, I mean, that is so much work. And I, I, I think we talk about it, but just the sheer reality of what it is that you've accomplished is incredible. Um, and, and so that's always been my passion is like, okay, how do we take you now? And like you said, pass on that blueprint. Um, so speaking of communities, I mean, that's an area that a superpower, um, I would, love to offer any of our superpowers um, to see if we could help take that blueprint and enable it to be activated by others, um, you know, Thank groups, you. grassroots groups like yourself in other states. Thank you. And, and, you know, our sustainability officer is majorly struggling. She's like, I don't have a staff. I don't have a social media presence. I don't know how to get this thing off the ground. I am absolutely floundering. Um, so, I mean, I know she needs help. Is it something, I mean, I know it's a ton of work and I know there's a huge part of this answer is going to be no, that's not possible. But like, I'm thinking about somebody I know here in Austin. Um, this is not, um, this is a very small, very unique school. Um, so it's not in the, it's not a normal public high school. Um, but they're the kind of people, their daughter is in, um, like in early high school, I bet she's like ninth grade. Anyway, they're the kind of people that like, as a, as a high school project, like she would totally, uh, so I'm wondering if this is something that like students could drive an initiative within the school. Um, and it could even start as like a school project, but then it could grow and and like you said, you like getting in and talking to the PTA and getting, I don't know. I just feel like there's some opportunity doing it that way. Now there are little bitty schools. So I think it's highly possible that they could do stuff. They don't have the same grounds as a proper school. So I don't even know that there's, um, you know, land to <laughs> do a garden and things like that. But I mean, they could still do, they could still do something, right? It could be indoor grow for herbs and vegetables, or I don't know, like they could figure some of this stuff out, but it could be really cool student-led projects, I wonder. Yeah, actually, um, I can share one more thing that I'm doing here. Can Am I sharing again? No, I'm not sharing. Here, I'll show you. So just today, I, can, I was working with a, a student um, at, at the school. Maybe that's not the one. Oh, shoot here him a young man today who was working oh by the way i created a whatsapp group right so we have like 144 families that are in that and so today our this is our intern this is the thing that i that i started now as a pta so he's our sustainability intern so he tells the kids okay show us your reusable water bottle and your straw, which to me, I was like, all right, that's kind of low hand, you know, that's not a big bang for your buck, but the kids came by, they were engaged, drawdowns behind them. So we had them, you know, they win a four ocean bracelet if they win and participate. So we had 215 kids come by over like four or five days. And then next month we'll do food waste uh, prevention and composting. So the kids learn alternatives. So, and that's how we got the kids involved and also door decorating contest. That was something the teacher recommended. That was a really, that's a really good strategy too, because then it's marketing throughout the school. The kids walk past the door 
And if it's about, by the way, the Earth Day theme this year is planet versus plastic. So I don't know, does anybody here have kids in school, school age kids? Nobody? Okay. Or, or school age nieces or nephews? Um, given your, yeah. your area, you might want to suggest that you could say, Hey, do a door decorating contest and we'll give a pizza party to the winning class or something like that. That's just a thought. What I love is all the opportunities, Sandy, to what you were saying and in, in connecting with organizations that are out there doing a lot of advocacy work like 350 or others are youth climate strikers. Like I just got connected. Well, they just sent me an email today to connect with them in, in Arizona again. And, you know, they, they go out and they advocate and they host town halls, but what are they doing specifically? And your slide on the, um, was it Arkansas or Alabama solar? Yeah. 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 Arkansas. We have, I mean, we of course have the same issue as you do, you know, it's like Florida, Arizona seem to be in a race to somewhere. And um, so we're looking for teachers and certainly to offset costs for education through solar on schools and a lot have done it um could be an, an enticing opportunity so that slide to share or if you have any other stats on that i'd be happy to get it up to the governor's office um too and um and that's why we're, we're also working on a composting initiative because like you sandy had mentioned this is about i mean wherever you want to start right a community garden your backyard a school yard garden or um a statewide infrastructure um and i think i may have told you michelle but i did learn that there is a bipartisan legislation out of the senate um with bozeman capito and carper um so some interesting states west virginia and arkansas and vermont coming together about looking at um not just a recycling, but a composting infrastructure across the country. Um, so I brought that to the attention of our senator's office because I don't think they knew about it. And I think it's a huge opportunity. Like you said, methane is super huge. But what I what I want to just offer up, because I don't necessarily mean these to just be, you know, climate focused, it is you've driven change. You know, you've you stepped forward and you drove change. What do you think are the attributes that you have that provide the courage and the wherewithal for you to, to do that? Um, I think, again, I think this is a hyper fact. I think, mm -hmm. you know, we have the high ground on this up and down. And the only thing stopping us is inertia and, and, convenience like people want to just keep going with the cheapest and most convenient um i feel that i could i couldn't do it without the support and the enthusiasm of parents and kids like i this is not a one woman show absolutely not it's too it's hard and it's just but it's it, and i actually have a great husband he's been really patient with me too i have to say he gives me a lot of moral support um but and and my kids you know the funny thing is my kids when my youngest was little, when I was doing the green team in my office, I did this sustainability expo for my colleagues where we had tables set up by stakeholders across the across the county that are working on, you know, bike 305 transportation and uh, yards and, and neighbors and yards through U University of Florida Extension Service or, you know, with rain barrels and all kinds of sort of basic things to reduce environmental impacts. And my youngest one said, you know, mom, I'll never forget this because I want to be like you when I grow up, you know, Raya and Colin, they don't care about this, but I care. <laughs> so it's not always easy to be a prophet in your own land, um, as I say, but I just think that finding the hook, really understanding intuitively when you're in it, like if I didn't have a kid in the school, I probably wouldn't understand kids need service hours. Parents want to still connect with their kids when they're in high school. Um, parents, there's a lot of helicopter moms. Parents want to build their kids' resume. So what really made this work was kids not only got recognized for their hours, half of parent hours could be added to their end-of-year recognition. Not for the service hours that are mandated by the state to graduate, but just for recognition. Um, and what I would tell, what I would say is a lot of times that kids 
they're easy to discourage. You know, they have a great idea and the teacher, oh, no, we can't do that because that's just not the way it's done. So what I would say is, no, 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 get your parent involved and say, what conditions have to exist in order for us to make this change? So it's the persistence, it's the parent support, it's kind of knowing everyone's lovers, I think, and 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 the fact that teachers, the principal can get recognized. So you got to, and I think coming from a big bureaucracy, I knew that this green team would have been, was possible because my agency has DHS sustainability awards for employees. So you've got to figure out what are the levers for the grass tops people and the grass roots folks. And that's, I think, created that synergy. That's fantastic. Well, I'm going to leave the Zoom open, but we're going to wrap it up. I'm going to turn off the recording in case you've got any questions, because I just I know there's connections here that need to happen. So um, I'm going to do that. I appreciate everybody joining us. And um, for our first kickoff, February, yes, it's February 1, but um, it's we've got a leap day. So we're counting it as the end of January. <laughs> Um, and we'll be back. Michelle, it was just such a pleasure, so much to learn from you and model and um, carry forward in the change that we want to see. So thank you.